Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for all that has come to pass already today. The worship, the prayers, the singing, your word. Lord, how it challenges us. Like we actually have to think about you. We actually have to wrestle with things related to the gospel. Right? And that's not an imposition. Right? That's your goodness to us. Right? That our thoughts are drawn upward. And Lord, so we pray that as we do wrestle with, with the application of Jonathan's message today, Lord, I pray that we would wrestle with it and that you would give us discernment. Lord, and, and, and we know that, that we're not going to do it perfectly. And yet I pray that, that we would grow in that discernment, that we would be better, better heralds of the gospel. Lord, that there would be people that we would reach because you sent this message to us today. What a, what a beautiful thing. God, and so we thank you for all that you've done already. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the teaching of your Trinity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah. All right. So for like the 10th time today, I'm going to say we're going to discuss the Trinity. And as, as Jake and Ryan were, and I were talking, like this is still somewhat of an introduction, right? Last week we had the introduction, like why is the knowledge of God so important? Well, just because it's essentially like the point of all things, right? It is life itself. Probably the most practical knowledge that we can have is what do we think and believe about God, right? Nothing else is going to influence our behaviors and attitudes like that. Do we truly believe that God is good and that his commands to us reflect his goodness, that they just aren't arbitrary things to test our faith, right? If, if we believe that, it's going to influence how we look at Scripture, right? Do we really believe that He works all situations for our sanctification, right? That, that we would be conformed to the image of His Son, and that sanctification is actually our greatest good, right? Do we really believe that? If so, then this influences, right, how we suffer, and this knowledge, we found out, it's not something that is inherent to us, right? God reveals himself to us through nature and through his word. And, and so if we think of God kind of as a picture, right? Nature can give us the outline, right? But, but it's God's word that like fills in the details, right? So we need God's word for salvation. We need God's word to really live the life right that he has purchased and given to us and so today with the trinity we're going to look at an aspect of god that well we need god's word to reveal right this is this is one of those details that we don't get in the outline right we don't get through nature and the trinity is not so much a characteristic of god as it is his his being and so this is why i say that this week is still somewhat of an introduction right as we go forward and, and we look at God's mutability, right? At God's providence, right? And, and, and all the other attributes that we'll be speaking about, right? We're going to speak about them, not about one of the people, not one person, not, not two out of three, but all three persons of the Godhead, right? And so these first two weeks, we're kind of laying a foundation, right? Why is the knowledge of God important? And then what is possibly, possibly, like the most basic aspect of God that distinguishes him from all else, right? Especially all other gods, so-called gods, right? His triune nature. And what's interesting about the Trinity is the difference, right, in how people will view it. Right? I, I looked up some things on the net, the wonderful internet, Google is certainly my friend, Right? And I found a couple of articles. And listen to the titles of them. Five Reasons the Trinity Matters So Much. Another title. The Doctrine of the Trinity. No Christianity Without It. Wow. That's kind of bold. Right? 
And it's coming back to our, you know, what we talked about before the recording went on, you know. Um, and then there was another one. Two reasons the Trinity matters. Apparently that guy, like, is not as big a fan of the Trinity as the guy who wrote the five ones. But it's still a big deal, right? Uh, Dr. Scott Swain, who is the president of Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, right? he calls the Trinity the supreme doctrine of the Christian faith. Right? Listen to this quote from him. He says this, The doctrines of creation and providence, there you go, Jake, <laughs> the person and work of Jesus Christ, the church and sacraments, salvation and last things, each of these doctrines rests on the doctrine of the triune God for its meaning and significance. So it is obvious that there are people out there that, like the Trinity matters. Like it is a huge deal, right? And then there's kind of like the rest of us, right? Listen to this introduction. I'm going to read not all of it, but, but parts of it to that aforementioned article, Two Reasons the Trinity Matters. And I quote, If you found out tomorrow that God is only one person instead of three, would your relationship with God feel any different? What about if you found out that your youth pastor, sorry, Mike Schoenrock, if you listen to this, <laughs> right, was a staunch modalist, would your church excommunicate him? And if so, besides AJ, would you all vote yes? Would you care? Right? Judging by the honest answers likely given to these questions, many modern Christians have lost the sense of why it being the Trinity is so important, even if they've retained it in their doctrinal statements. So we understand, right, to be orthodox, historical Christians, we must believe in the Trinity, right? That's, we're all saying, that's a tier one issue. But for most of us, that's about as far as that ship is sailing, right? Like, don't ask me why it's such a big deal. It just is, right? That's, that's going to be like a lot of, even if it's not in here. I understand you guys are all well-educated theologians. But, but for many, right, for many Christians, that's going to be like their, their answer. Like if you're like, so why is the Trinity such a big deal? It just is, right? Don't ask, don't, don't make me explain it, right? And, and, and so, and so that's kind of where we're at, right? And so today our goal, it's not to turn us all into Trinitarian enthusiasts, right? We're not all <laughs> supposed to become Dr. Scott Swain, right? Who, if, for those who don't know him, like if you look him up. Like, he, he's written, like, three or four books on the Trinity, right? That dude is a Trinitarian enthusiast, right? That, that's, that's, that's not my goal today. Now, if you become one, amen. God's providence, right? <laughs> you know? However, we do want to at least be able to answer that question, right? Why? Why does the Trinity matter? And so to that end, we're going to look at Three questions, right? This is the this is the three part message, right? <laughs> no, it's not. So first, like, what is the Trinity? Second, like everyone's favorite, what is not the Trinity, right? And this may be one, like, this is actually really important for us um, because so many times we try and explain the Trinity, and and it we get into trouble. <laughs> Right. And then third, and this is where I think kind of the payoff is going to be like, so what? Like, why does it matter? So first, and, and, and for a lot of this, right, this isn't going to be new information. Like, you'll probably all fall asleep through this first part. Like, what is the Trinity? So it's ones and threes, right? We already know that. But, but anyway, so that's the first one we're going to answer. What is a Trinity? The Bible shows us one God revealed in three distinct persons. Right? Simple, super simple statement to say, right? But I would say, like from the book of Second Opinions, which is the one that I wrote that's not in the canon, right? I would say it's impossible to understand. And, and now, this is my opinion. Like the more we try and reconcile ones and threes and, and like figure out like how does this work? 
right? The more likely we're gonna end up with a massive headache, frustrated, in error, or all of that mixed up together, right? Because there's really nothing in creation that is triune like God. Like his triunity, it's a fact. It's revealed in scripture that tells us part of this basic nature of God. Right? And yet, it also points to his incomprehensibility. Right? Remember last week, there are things about God that we're just never going to know or understand. Right? Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. Take me a minute to unravel the sheets. And how the Trinity works, like I believe that's one of them. However, though we may not understand how it works, the fact that God is triune is necessary for us to live out our life as Christians. Right? Because what does what does the end of that verse say? Right? But the things he has revealed, he has given them to us and our children, right, that we may obey him. So using the language of the Westminster Confession, we read, in the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. And just a little bit of, of, of confession trivia. I bet you didn't know that Blackbeard like, wrote part of the confession. Did you catch that? Arr, in the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons, right? <laughs> That's not true, but like I saw that and I read that and like SpongeBob came to mind for whatever <laughs> reason, right? Um, but getting back to like the serious matter at hand somewhat, um, but there is but one God, right? We as Christians are monotheistic. We don't worship many gods. We don't even worship three gods, right? One God, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Like everyone knows it, even if you don't recognize the reference. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? And this is in keeping with, Ryan, divine simplicity, right? God is not made up of parts, right? God has no dependencies. And so here's the thing. God is not made up of Father, Son, and Spirit. Any more than he is made of love and holiness and wrath and justice, right? Just as God is his attributes, it's what it means to be God, right? God is love. God is holiness, right? He also is Father, Son, and Spirit, right? All are God. And so as the coming weeks, we speak of God's attributes, right? We are speaking of the attributes of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and they all have these attributes in their fullness into infinity, right? And for example, the Father is no more or less loving than the Son or the Spirit, right? That's somewhat, for some reason, that's like a thing you hear, right? The God of the Old Testament, he's just such a meanie. But Jesus, he's cool, right? He doesn't judge, right? You know, no, man, that's not right, you know? But this doesn't mean that they have an equal portion, of the love of God, right? It's not like the Father has 33.33% of God's love, so on and so forth, right? God is infinite in all his attributes. You don't divide infinity into parts, right? And this is keeping with divine infinity. If all three persons are fully God, then they must partake completely of the divine essence. And so if the Father really did, have only one third of the love of God, and the Son the other third, and the Spirit the third, then you know what that means? That the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are not fully God. Right? And that's a problem. And and, and we'll we'll get to that. We will we will get to that. And so just a little bit of grammar. Like if you hear people talking about the Trinity and they're using this word essence. Right? Think of essence as kind of like godness. There's but one divine essence, and all three persons of the Trinity 
fully partake in that essence, right? So essence kind of will speak a little bit towards the unity, right? And just, I'm sure you have all heard that before. And it's, again, just review. So we see how there is one God. Now let's move on. How about the three, right? This God is in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Like, think of Matthew's account of the baptism of Jesus. Like, I love this. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been awesome to, like, have been there, right? You see Jesus, the eternal Son, coming up out of the water, the Spirit descending and, 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 and alighting on him, you know, in the form of a dove. And you hear the Father say, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I mean... That would have just been, like, my mind's eye. I don't know if they're, they're, well, there's so much of the Bible that is beautiful, but for some reason, that just captures my imagination. Man, there's just something about that, right? So we see the three people, the three persons, but what distinguishes them? Right? We know they are one in essence. You know, and, and, and when we use the language persons, right, this really speaks to that distinctness in the Trinity. Like each person in the Godhead, though sharing fully in the divine essence, is distinct from the other. And the distinctions are as follows. The Father is not begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. And the Spirit eternally proceeds from both. And like whenever I read that, I kind of feel let down. A little bit, right? Because you're like, okay, give it to me. Like, what makes them different? And then you hear that and you're like, huh, okay. Like, like I don't really understand it. And yet, that is it. Right? There, there's no more. Right? That is what makes them different. But what's interesting is how these personal distinctions are seen in the roles that each plays in the works of God. Right? In general, we say that the Father works through the Son, by the Spirit. For example, in redemption, the Father sends the Son to accomplish redemption, and then both send the Spirit to apply redemption to God's people. So each person in the Godhead fulfills their individual roles to accomplish the singular will of God in regards to salvation. And these roles correspond to their personal properties. Right? The Father is never sent. Right, The Son never proceeds from the Father and the Spirit. And, and you may hear people talk about, AJ, what is it? The economic? The, econ the economic trinity. And, and that's really what it is. An economic, not in, in, in Justin's like world of the economy, but it's more of in like the household. Right? How do they interact within each other and then within God's work? A wonderful passage, and this is not one that I think is traditionally looked at as being a Trinit uh, Trinitarian passage, but if we would look at John chapter 10, verses 27 to 38, I actually think this is a great text for the Trinity because you get the fullness of it, right? And I'm not going to read it for sake of time, but in verse 27, Jesus says, hey, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28 says, I give them eternal life. Verse 29 states that his father has given the sheep to him. And verse 30 states Jesus and the father are one. So within this text, what do we see? We see the distinctness of the works of the father and of the son, right? So there are differences. It's not one God, right? The father gives, the son gathers. And yet we also see, right, the unity, right? The Father and I are one. And, and in this text, I believe what's really emphasized is that of the singular will and purpose. And, and just so people won't go, ah, ah, but, 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 but hold on, man, that's just the Father who does this, and then he acts like the Son who does that. Right? If you read on, verse 38, Jesus states that the Father is in him, and he is in the Father. Right? And chapter, was that? chapter 10 of John. And you'll hear that type of language a lot in the high priestly prayer as well, right? And, and what that's called is, is mutual indwelling of the persons of the Trinity, right? And again, this is something like we try and wrap our minds around and it doesn't, it doesn't compute, right? And, and that's, I'm going to say this, but it, 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 it really speaks of occupying the same sacred space but don't think of God as space, 
right? He's infinite. But essentially, it's that, right? It's it's the the constant, like like movement of the divine essence. So that the three persons of the Godhead, they all are in constantly indwelling each other. And so, like when you see the Son, you actually are getting the Father and the Spirit as well. And and really, what this what this points to is not just the unity, right? But they share fully in this divine essence, right? Which does include will and purpose. And there's a Greek term, para, parachoresis, that this talks about, which I didn't pronounce well at all. Um, Kevin DeYoung, if any of you like him, he does a pretty good article on it. But since this class wasn't just on that, I was like, eh. I'm just going to take that one line um, and sum it up. But I really think that that, like for me, I, I love that John chapter 10, verse 27 to 38. Usually people speak of it, right, as as this shows the security, right, of the believer. You know, I have them in my hand. The Father has them in it and, and stuff. And, and yet, what do we see, right? Our security is based on the triune nature, like God would have to stop being God for us to lose our salvation, right? The father taking back what he had given the son, you know, uh, like mutiny within the Godhead, right? And that doesn't happen because they are of one essence. So that's just a high level overview. What is the Trinity? Again, probably just review, like for, for most of us, and that's a good thing. So on to our second question, like, what is not the Trinity? What is the Trinity not like? So someone tell me, class participation, please. Why is the Trinity not like water? Feel free. God doesn't change. That's, yes, yeah. Yeah, water, you know, liquid, solid. Vapor. You. Yeah, to, to get water from a solid to liquid or to a gas, there has to be time that that allows it to, to change. And God is infinitely Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah. He doesn't just appear in solid or appear in gas. He is all three, all the time. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Water is one thing playing three different roles. There also has to be a means in which, like in with time, there has to be a driving force to change them, temperature, yeah. whatever it is, um, and that doesn't... Work. It doesn't fit. Yeah. So that's good. Why? What's the other? That's another one. Why is the Trinity not like an egg? Right? I've heard this before. It's shell, yolk, albumen. It's the Trinity. It's like our God. Like, why is that not true? Three things, right? They're three separate things, but they're not the same substance. Because you can't separate them. <laughs> and, 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 and none of them by themselves is an egg. Like, the yolk is not an egg, right? Um, so why is the Trinity not like a three-leafed clover? Has anyone ever heard that before? No one's ever, man, y'all been living under a rock? Come on. <laughs> Anyone heard of the egg thing before? No. <laughs> what about the water thing? Well, the clover thing is kind of, the water will be in the room, will be, they're going to all come on the same thing. Each, each clover, or each leaf is not the entire clover. Ding, 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 ding. Very good, very good, right? Right? I love that. But why is the Trinity not like us? Mind, body, and soul. Some of these, like, we've already given the same, it's like the same answer in some ways, right? Like, why are we not triune like God? Anyone? Three things. I mean, yeah, the, 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 the mind is not the body. There you go. It's not the same substance. Like, none are me. Like, in and of themselves. Right? Why is the Trinity not like Voltron? You guys know what Voltron is? You know, it's it's the 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 the, the robot lions, 
who like all come together to form like this giant robot, and they only do it when like there's a really really bad bad guy. Power Rangers. Yeah, like the Power Rangers. Like, why is the Trinity not like that? Why is the Trinity not like the Power Rangers? He's got something made up, made up of hearts. Oh, man, dude! You That's you. awesome, man. He's on it. He's on it. Like, haven't you guys ever... You guys have never heard, like, the Trinity, like, Voltron or the Power Rangers? Man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, think, I have a question that hopefully doesn't send us too far off topic. Um, why do we, we generally, as humans, have a want so badly to come up with a metaphor. <laughs> Man. Why, why do we have to have a comparison? Why can't it simply be... Just, just it is this. God. I think there is a quest like to understand. Like I think there really is like from a a good part, right? Not not misintention, but but we long to understand. And so we try and, and I mean the Bible uses analogies a lot. Right? God is like a strong tower. Right? He saves with his mighty right arm. You know, Jesus, right, when he saw Jerusalem, said how he longed to 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 like gather them in like a like a mother hen with her chicks, right? It's one of my favorites. Like God is not really a cosmic chicken, right? You know? I mean, but it's an analogy, right? And and so I think there is biblical right basis for it. Um, but there are just certain things that, you know, it just doesn't work for. And so when we use these things, right, we, we end up misrepresenting who God is, right? And being the Trinity, it's like fundamental to his nature and his works. And, and like out of all the things we said, right, they all seem to boil down to like two things, three as well, two things really, right? Um, Right, one one person or one thing playing three different roles, or we have three people that are not of the same essence, and, and then the last, we have this problem of divine simplicity. Right, none of these things are in and of themselves like the full three leaf clover. Right, that that's that's a that's a wonderful one, mind, body, and soul. Like you can know all of these. The egg, the yolk is not the egg, and so divine simplicity really throws a monkey wrench in all of our analogies, right? All of these things are complex things, like me. I'm very complex, right? So are you guys. And God is the simplest of all beings. I'm not stealing your thunder, right? I'm laying a foundation yeah, like for this. Months, they're going to forget by that. Dude, anyway. <laughs> no, I'm, man, I, I really... Like, enjoy divine simplicity. You guys got to come back for divine simplicity. Like, I really enjoy it. It's like one of those things you're like, what? Uh, but you'll leave and you'll, you'll, you will be an enthusiast of divine simplicity after that. You, you'll like it. Um, and so, what is the use of these analogies? So, there, I believe there is a good use, right? When we talk to our kids, we don't say God is like water. We can talk to our kids and say, God is not like water. And we explain why. I think in, is it philosophy? It's called the way of negation, right? Is that right? Where, where you essentially say, you kind of say what something is by saying what it's not. And it's, it's, it's not as effective as saying what something is, but when it's something that is really hard to wrap our minds around, it actually becomes a very effective tool, right? And so, like, I can't believe, like, water is, like, the only thing you guys heard of, man. <laughs> But, but our kids, like, right? They're going to know Voltron and Power Rangers. You know, you can use it. It's not. The Trinity is not like that. Right? But we can use these things, even though we don't want to use them in a positive way. Right? To help teach. And, and it, it will help get across a little bit this mystery of the Trinity. So we, 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 we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, there is good use for them. And, and, like, this little exercise here of saying, why is it? It's good that we we think, right? We, 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 as we were talking about before, we wrestle, right? Our minds actually expand when we, when we think of these things, right? And when we think of, the, when we think of things in a Godward way, right? It's, it's about practicing, right, our, our, our biblical worldview. So 
Now we're going to move on to question three. Why any of this even matters? Like, what's the big deal, right? And this is again, right? This is where I think the payoff is. And like I said, for the most part, it's all been review. And even this, right? We're not going to say anything that anyone's going to go, oh, wow, mind blown. Like, if I do say something like that, tell me, because it's probably wrong. I mean, honestly. Like, more than likely, the response, or at least the response that I'm going for, is this. Oh, like, that makes sense. Like, as we went through these things on the Trinity, right? Why is it not like this? Right? I mean, none of that was like, oh, man, no, it's, it's like we may not have thought through these things like that, but it's like, I get it. It makes sense. Right? That's what we want here. All right? So so maybe we've never thought of these particular ideas in a Trinitarian way, but I think everyone will go, huh, I get it. I get it. So let, let's go on. Why does the Trinity matter? Well, first, like, what type of God do you want? Right? Do you really want the Hallmark God? Right? Remember that from last week? The God that just needs you so much. He's just in heaven pining for you. Because we, in some way, we, we complete him. He has a he has a Josh Dent sized hole in his heavenly heart that just he needs you, Josh. I mean really? Really? I mean think about that. Right? Do we really want a God that needs people like us? Seriously. Like a God that needs me? I need him. Right? I don't want a God that needs me. Sinful, imperfect me? But let's kind of, like there's truth in that, right? But let's peel this back just a little bit deeper. Right? If God needs anything, that means he's not what begins with a P? Someone say it. Ends with an act. Yes. If God needs anything, He is not perfect. So, do you really want a God who's not perfect? Right, a God who has some type of inherent weakness, because that means God can possibly be manipulated. Right. That that means God can possibly be exploited. You can make deals and bargain with him if he's not perfect, right? And just carry that thought out. Like, that's scary. That's scary. And this, this is just in one single aspect. Think about justice, right? Why do we not have perfect justice down here besides when, you know, man is not omniscient? You know, why is it? Because our judges can be bought and sold. Like, you know, if I go do a crime and someone rich and famous does a crime, why is the book thrown at me and they get off with a book deal and like 10 hours of community service? You know, <laughs> because our judges can be manipulated, right? Do we really want eternity to be bought and sold? I don't think so. And so I want a perfect God. Many, many other reasons, right? And this is where I challenge you guys. Like, why do you want a perfect God? Why do you need? Like, why do we need a perfect God? Justice is one of them. But this is something to think about, right? Because here's what we're going to find. And I'm probably jumping to my conclusion, but oh well. Like, God is exactly the God that we need, right? In every single possible way. In all that He is. Like, we need, there's not an aspect or an attribute of God that is unnecessary for us. Like we need all of him, including his triune nature. Right? And so that's just, it's not homework. I'm not going to quiz you guys, but it's probably something good. Why do I want and need a perfect God? And, and, and then I don't answer the question, why is God like exactly, exactly the God that I need? Right? And remember last week we had that, that quote from Stephen Lawson that said, you know, God didn't create, you know, because of any inherent need that he had, but it was an overflow of his own goodness to share himself with creation. Right? It's an act of his own free will. Like, why is this true? Well, in part, it's because God for all eternity, prior to creation, existed as Father, Son, 
in spirit, right? In perfect relationship, perfectly fulfilled, perfectly loving and loved, right? Why does God know what it's like to love? It's not because he made us, right? It's because of his triune nature, right? Glorifying each other, right? God had, what was it Jesus said? You know, Father, glorify me with the, the glory I had before the foundations of the world, right? They glorified each other, right? Perfectly satisfied within himself, right? The Trinity is a part of God's perfection, right? That's why we have the term. Has anyone, please tell me, you've heard the term blessed Trinity before? Yes, yes, right? And blessed essentially, like he dumbed it way down, it means happy. Like, why is God the happy God? Is it because of you and me, the green grass, the universe? No. God is the happy God because of himself, right? So why does the Trinity matter? Because God's perfection matters, right? God's perfection matters. When you take away the Trinity, we got big problems. We got big problems. So why does the Trinity matter? How about eternal life, right? That's the party we're all invited to, right? To share in this inherent happiness and satisfaction of God that he has and is, right? In part because of his triune nature. And we don't bring anything to that party. We're just takers, right? Right, Scott Swain, I, I like the dude, right? So I quote him. He said that, that God does not need any benefit, right? He is benefit, right? So if God were not triune, the very basis of our relationship with him would change, right? And so remember that question at the beginning, if you woke up and, and, and found out God was only one person, would things change? Yes, they would change immensely. We may not realize it, but they would change immensely, right? God currently, as perfect, he is the fountain of all blessing, right? We sing it in the doxology every week. I love that. Praise God from whom... Like 90% of our blessings flow. No, from whom all blessings flow, right? And who are we? We're just the needy beggar, right? If God's not perfect, if he does need us, like that's no longer true. That is no longer true, right? Could we even say, Isaiah chapter 55, right? Verse one, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, a beggar like me, come buy and eat. Come by wine and milk without money. Praise the Lord and without price. Right? Could we, would it really be free? Or would there be a cover charge to that party now? You know? Right? Or what about Psalm 16, verse 11? Probably one of my favorite verses. Uh, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Right? If God is not triune, right? Is there really fullness of joy? Or are we making up for some lack? Right? And so the Trinity matters. It's the quality. The quality of our eternal life matters. And so why does the Trinity matter? Basically, our salvation, right? Jesus had to be both fully God and fully man. Right? Fully man to represent humanity, to be our federal head, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, right? By one man's obedience, the many be made righteous. So as a man, Jesus fulfills the law, right? He upholds the covenant of works that Adam fails, and as a man, he died, right? As our substitute. But Jesus also had to be fully God. And I'm going to quote, don't you too? Don't shoot me from a Gospel Coalition blog. <laughs> They're okay in, in, in certain things, all right? Before you judge, just listen to what this guy says, Eric Raymond. I think he says this well. You guys be the judge, right? This may be the only thing he says well. I don't know. By nature, this wrath, God's wrath against sin, is infinite in quality, right? Divine infinity. Amen. In order to bear the weight of wrath, it's essential that the Savior be divine, but also in order to satisfy this wrath, he had to offer a sacrifice of such value that God would be pleased to accept it. Right? Only God can appease God. So if Jesus is not fully God, then his sacrifice 
is not of infinite value. I would say this, right? Even if Jesus, like, took the wrath of 99.9%, like, of my needed for my salvation, I only had that 0.01%, I'd, I'd still be going to hell. What am I going to offer to appease infinite wrath? Right? Yes, our prayers and our sacrifice, our obedience, our sweet-smelling saviors. Right? They are. They please God. And yet none of them is able to satisfy the infinite wrath. Right? So why does eternity matter? Well, our salvation matters. Right? What are we hearing? Eternity right, is at stake. We don't want it to be bought and sold. Right? We don't want our eternal life right, to be less than everything it should be. Eternity is a long time, fellas. I mean, think about it, right? And we want to even just have a shot at it. So it, it matters. And we can go on and on and on, right? If the Holy Spirit is not fully God, what does that do to the Bible? Right? No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. Right? If the Spirit is not fully God, is the Bible really... What, 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 what is the word I'm looking for? Infallible, right? Is it? You know? And so this is really important. In closing, does the Trinity matter? Yes! Like, hopefully we can answer that question now, right? And I think it matters more than we know and understand. And far from being just a theory that pastors think about, it's truly a foundation of our faith, right? Because it's a foundation of our God. And even of our purpose, right? The Eternal Father has loved the eternal Son and the fellowship of the eternal Spirit. Right? And as image bearers of God, there is maybe no greater thing we can do than worship and love the Father through the Son that He has put forth to us by the power of the Spirit who has been sent right, to teach us how to bear that glorious image. Right? Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. So our very worship and purpose has a triune shape to it because that's who our God is. So yes, the Trinity matters. We'll go ahead and pray. Father, Lord, we may not fully understand like this great mystery. Lord, I'm sure we have all thought about this incorrectly. But Lord, I pray, Father, that we will have a greater appreciation for you from today. Lord, I, I pray that we would thank you for your triune nature. Lord, that we see that it is absolutely essential for you to be the God that we need so that we can be the people that you created us to be. And so God, just at the end of it all, we just say, God, thank you for being who you are. And we ask that you would continue to reveal yourself to us Right, that we may live out that divine and wonderful and glorious purpose of bearing your image to a lost and fallen world and finding our purpose and fulfillment and joy in doing so. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.